I'd like to continue thoughts related to John, but this time focusing on the 40th chapter of Isaiah to see the words that are captured there for us, the words of Isaiah the prophet. So if you wanted to go to Isaiah 40, we can look together at this message. I appreciate that the song, Saints Lift Your Voices, is clearly modeled on Isaiah chapter 40. Thank you for leading that song. And again, the purpose of Isaiah 40 is laid out at verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. This is the major premise for um, This is the major premise for uh, what this passage is about. And it had been something that John was teaching about as repentance for forgiveness, as a way for the Lord to enter, to, that we might see the salvation and mercy of God. It was in Luke 3, verses 3 through 6. That was... That was the way that John was putting these things together. But if we look again at, at this uh, chapter on our uh, on our own here, we have that six, seven, and eight together after this cry in the wilderness. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. It's Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. What does it mean? The word is both our heritage and our legacy. That means it's our past and our future. The flesh is grass, its beauty like the flower. The grass withers, the flower fades. The people are grass. The word stands forever. All of earth is temporary, you know. People come and people go. Um, that's true about life. These are temporary things for different reasons and in different ways. Places go up, places come down, you know, different businesses, different buildings, whatever. Can hardly recognize home when you go back sometimes. <laughs> if you ever go back to your hometown where you think you should know your way around and you can't recognize anything. <laughs> and as he said in Isaiah 40, even... The beautiful things are just for a season. The flowers, the flower of the field is its beauty, but the flower fades too. The grass withers, the flower fades. Ecclesiastes 3.11 said, God has made everything beautiful in its time. And he's put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. It's just saying earth is temporary. Uh, beauty is fleeting. Beauty is beauty fades. The beautiful things, they're just for a season. The flowers are short-lived, you know. They're here for a time, but they're gone before summer. What is the point? Well, the point is what he said, the word of our God will stand forever. And this is the response? Yes. This is the response to verse 1. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. We take comfort in the word of God that will stand forever. Because the word is our heritage, it's our past, where we came from. And the word is our legacy, it's our future, where we are going. Those who live before us by faith 
live by faith in God's word. And, and this same word is what saved them and us. We take, care, uh, we take comfort in this thing. It is what is eternal. It is what came before and what will come after. The rest of it is unknowable, as Ecclesiastes goes to great detail to show us. The rest of life is unknowable. Like I said, people come and people go. Places go up, places come down. The beauty and the grandeur of a thing, it fades. You know, shiny objects tarnish. <laughs> Dust gathers. That's just the way of the world. Not trying to be morbid, just saying earth is temporary. But the word of God is not temporary. The word of God will stand forever. He is our God. That's what came before us. That's what will be here after us. Those who came before us came not in the flesh, but came in the spirit. Those who believed the same word and were saved. And those who follow us will not necessarily follow in the flesh, but will follow because they also will believe the same word and also be saved in the same way by the same God on the same promises. The word is our heritage, our legacy. And that is comfort. Yes, he said, comfort, comfort my people in 40 verse 1 of Isaiah. But then you see in the 9th through the 11th verses some things that look super familiar. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. His arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He'll gather the lambs in his arms. He'll carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This also is comfort because he said, Zion, Jerusalem is the herald of good news. Do you know what the herald of good news is? When you put it into New Testament language, it's the preacher of the gospel. <laughs> preacher in the New Testament is a word that means a herald, the person who sounds the trumpet on behalf of the king, the heralder. And the good news is the gospel. The herald of good news is the preacher of the gospel. Jerusalem, Zion, herald of good news, lift up your voice and say, behold your God. So Jerusalem, Zion is the ones. Israel are the ones who taught us about Jesus, and it's true. They did. We know everything we know about God because of Israel. Romans 3.2 records that the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. It, what people had, what God said, the Jews. Ancient Israel are the ones who had what the Lord actually said to mankind. That's what they wrote down. But he also said in Romans 11, in verse 15, if their rejection at this time, their rejection of the gospel, means the reconciliation of the world. Because when they rejected the gospel, the gospel was sent to the Gentiles. If their rejection of the gospel at this time means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? It was always intended for them to obey the gospel, and some of them did. And those who did became the ones that we know a great deal about, the apostles of our Lord who recorded the New Testament for us, those who became part of the church in the first century, starting in Acts 2 and following. That's who they are. They are this Israel, the herald of good news, the preacher of the gospel. And they tell us, the rest of the world, behold your God. 
It's the Son of God, Jesus Christ, come in the flesh. Through Israel, yep. Our salvation is through Israel. We would know nothing about God if it weren't for them. We owe everything to them. But consider again Isaiah 40 at verse 11. Specifically, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He'll gather the lambs in his arms. How familiar this looks, don't you think? Jesus picked up this very same language, you know. He'll carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is the comfort when Jesus comes and is teaching. This is how Jesus cares for us who believe him, us who obey him. It is the comfort of God, like a shepherd gathering the lambs. After the way is prepared for him to come in, then it's like this. Well, then there is also in Isaiah 40, I think I have my reference wrong, but that's okay. 17 and 18 of Isaiah 40, All the nations are as nothing before him, and they are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? And in the 23rd verse, it says, He brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither. You see that? He blows on them and they wither, verse 24. That is borrowed from verse 7. All flesh is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. It's continuing the thought. But when he blows on these rulers of the earth, they wither. To who then, verse 25 said, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him? Says the Holy One. And it's what we sang. There is none like him. None can compare. No God his equal, no prince his heir. Yes, the rulers of the earth, well, they're the rulers of the earth, but that doesn't mean that they dictate salvation. Doesn't mean that they tell who is and who is not going to be saved. God is the one. These rulers of the earth, they come and go too. <laughs> Their buildings go up and come down too. They're temporary just like everything else on earth. The word of God endures forever. There's no equal for God. There's none like him. In the 26th down through the 31st verses of Isaiah 40, he said, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, because he is strong in power and not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my right hand disregarded by my God? Haven't you known? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, to the one who has no strength, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. These are the promises of God, the comfort that he has for his people. The first thing that he says in this part of the passage, verse 26, who created these? <laughs> it's what John said, God can raise to Abraham children from these rocks. Where did these come from? 
God did this. Who created these? God created these. He who brings out their host by number. You know, the host is a standing army. He brings them out by number, calling them all by name. He knows every individual. He knows everybody's name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. God rescued every single one of them. He leads us forth. He knows us by name. We are his creation, created in him for good works. And it's what Jesus said in John 10 about himself being the good shepherd. He said there in John 10 at verse 2, He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, verse 3 of John 10, The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The gatekeeper recognizes him and opens to him. The sheep hear his voice. They know his voice. They don't follow the voice of the stranger. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. John 10, 3. Not one's missing. John 10, 14 to 15. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. I know my own, my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Not one is missing. He saves us. There's great comfort in that. Jesus is the good shepherd. The strength comes from God. And again, at verse 27, Why say, O Jacob, why, why speak, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my right is disregarded by my God? You know, we shouldn't think that God doesn't see it. He does see it. We're suffering or we're, we're going through some difficulty. People are not doing right to us because we love God, because we serve God. Why think my way is hidden, my right is disregarded? No, God sees it, though you may be mistreated. That's true. And you may suffer. And there is injustice in this life with people, but not so with God. God sees it. He knows. Why should you say otherwise, he says, Isaiah says, in 40, 27, 28, haven't you known, haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. We shouldn't think that he doesn't see it. It's just more complicated than we know. There are more things that were at stake and more things at work than we realize. We're a part of this thing but not the whole. He who gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, I'm sorry, he gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths will faint and be weary. Young men fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. He is the one who gives power to the faint, those that are weak, those that are tired. <laughs> The power comes from God. The reason we make it through our trials and temptations is God is helping us. And if we are waiting for the Lord, not taking our own vengeance, not making our own justice, but waiting for the Lord, God will renew our strength. You wonder, where, is, where am I going to get the next, you know, where am I going to get my second wind? Well, you're going to get it from God. Those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. He helps us. He knows what we're going through. He sent his son Jesus to die for us, but he sent his son Jesus also to live for us. He lived in the flesh. He knows what it's like to be tested. And I, let's go back here. Yes. And I'll ask you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 6 in closing. But 
which I believe we've read recently, and that's all right. But it's the 9th through the 12th verses, and it still applies, and I think we should look at it together. It's Hebrews 9, I'm sorry, Hebrews 6, verse 9 through 12. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. God is, there's not going to be injustice with God as though he doesn't see our way, he doesn't see our suffering, he doesn't see the price that we're paying or the work that we're doing. That's not how God is going to be. He won't overlook your work and the love you've shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Of course, you do have to be working and you do have to have love and serve the saints and still have love and still work. And we desire each of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We desire that each one of you show the same earnestness to have full assurance of hope till the end. That is, we have to stick with it. We have to be strong. We have to stay the course. But our strength is renewed by God. We take comfort because he sent his son for us. We take comfort because we have a shepherd who knows and who walks the way with us. We take comfort because God has proclaimed it. And his word stands. And these words of Isaiah from so long ago, you know, centuries ago, are still ringing in our ears because the God who spoke them is still speaking today. And we're hearing these things, and we're, we're with them. Isaiah is our brother. He loved God the way that we love God, and he wanted to do God's will the way that we want to do God's will. That's our brother. And we intend to join hands with all those that follow after us, who also fear God and keep his commandments, who also seek him according to his word. Because I won't be here, you know, in a little while I won't be here. Um, my nation may not be here, you know. My house, whatever. But I know what will. Oh, I know what will. The word of God will be here. And there's going to be brothers and sisters that I haven't met be people who obey the gospel, people who love God and who serve him. Those are my brothers and my sisters. Can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see it when we go to heaven, we get to meet each other. It's pretty cool. So take comfort in the word and take comfort in our God whom we serve, who sees these things, who knows what we're going through, who provides for us and with whom there's not injustice. He sees He'll pay us back. It will be just in the end. Today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Obtain for yourself forgiveness of sins by repenting and coming to serve this God who has done so much for us. We have water ready. We, we're ready to help you to obey the gospel of Jesus if, if that is your need. Is your need today as a Christian to repent because you've not been living the life of faith that you were called to. You've not been doing the works of God that we are created to do. Well, repent. Change your heart to serve God from now on. Let us pray with you and for you too that you can be strengthened because we're all, you know, we're all working towards the same goal in the same place. We're all temporary. We're all flesh. God is the one who is perfect. God's word is the one that is perfect. If we can pray on your behalf for your spiritual need, if we can help you to obey the gospel of Jesus, please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>